Policy Matters, this is Mongo Slate. So today we're going to talk about gender neutrality. And California wants to sign a law which forces retail stores to make all of their departments unisex in relation to boys and girls sections. Um, that's going to be what we're going to talk about. So today we're going to read an article from Reason to talk about this proposed law. Then I'm going to give you some background on where this stuff comes from. Basically, it comes from the idea that um, gendered, quote unquote, gendered toys um, are stifling the development of children. And then I'm going to go backwards into looking at that, how that is a myth. Um, Steven Pinker wrote an entire book called The Blank Slate Myth. But we're going to read a, a bit of a piece that he actually wrote um, several years ago. Um, if you probably heard of uh, Steven Pinker, I don't agree with everything that he says, especially politically. But he is also he he's never been known really to be a liar from a scientific perspective. And this idea that um, boys and girls don't have any innate nature is based on the blank slate myth that everything is environmental and everything is about what you learn and what you come in contact with. It is absolute bullshit. But when you're not in control of the uh, of society, people can do whatever they want. This is actually a totalitarian control. And that's going to be one of the other things I'm going to read about here is how people use language to control your behavior. All right. So this this might be a long one. This might be a long one, but strap in. OK, so we're going to restart with reason uh, written by Christina Christian Ritz Schieg. I don't know what the hell that means, but it was published February 23rd, 2021. California bill would give $1,000 fines to retailers with separate girls and boys toy sections. Retail stores in most of California are only allowed to operate at 25% capacity. A new bill in the state legislature would ensure that whatever part of their shop is allowed to be open is inclusive as possible. Last week, Assembly members Evan Lowe and Christina Garcia, both of them Democrats, uh, introduced a bill that would require retailers to offer their toys and child care products in a gender neutral format, brick and mortar shops will have to display the majority of their products and clothing aimed at children in one undivided unisex area on the sales floor. They also be barred from putting up signage that will indicate whether a product was intended for a boy or a girl. So this is a free speech violation, of course, but, you know, it doesn't matter when you're a Democrat and you live in California. California-based retailers that sell children's products online will also have to have a page on their website that offers these products in a gender-neutral fashion. The bill will allow retailers to title that section of the website Kids, Unisex, or Gender Neutral. The bill is identical to one that Lowe introduced last year, telling Politico at the time that he was hoping to create a more inclusive shopping experience. And, quote, this is a, it's, 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 it's an issue of children being able to express themselves without bias, he said. Lowe dropped the bill in May to prioritize COVID-19, but promised to pick up the fight later, saying in a statement that, quote, the policy behind this bill is not only important in regards to addressing perceived societal norms, but also ensuring that prejudice and judgment does not play a prominent role in our children's lives. I look forward to working on this issue in the future. If passed, stores that did not that did put dresses in a separate girls section could be hit with a one thousand dollar civil fine. The policy would only apply to retail departments with over five hundred employees. So again, they're they're targeting big businesses. They are targeting Walmart. They're targeting Target. Um, these types of places because they can afford to, you know. So they're trying to force this issue, right? Now it says here that Target actually started doing it on its own. That it started. Uh, voluntarily uh removing the gendered sections but now they want to pass a law that's going to force other companies to do the same you know it's not enough to you to do it yourself you have to be forced to do it by the state so where does this idea come from so let's go to michigan state university uh this was written november the 30th 2016 by tracy trotner the dangers of gender-based toys the danger is dangerous like fire and uh, a knife is dangerous for your child to have a gender-based toy. Let's read this. 
During the holiday shopping season, notice the look and feel of different toy aisles. The light colored aisles have toys that revolve around beauty and domesticity. And the dark aisles are filled with related to building action and aggression. The same can be seen in the different boy and girl clothing sections. When young children enter the store that has a toy aisle, they are drawn to the one that is lined with dark or bright colors, depending on their gender. Why is that? I mean, you could just darken pink, right? <laughs> okay. Well, research indicates that at an early age, toddlers learn that pink or light packaging is intended for girls in blue or dark packaging is intended for boys. Cognitive brain research shows that all babies actually prefer blue. As they get older, through media and adult influence, they learn, quote unquote, what toys are appropriate for them to choose from. However, girls will frequently choose a toy intended for boys if it is pink, such as a pink airplane over a traditional girl toy. The strong preference for pink or blue usually happens at about age two. According to University of California sociologist, sociologist, sociology is not science, even though it's supposed to be the study of. Ology means the study of. So sociology is the study of society. Biology is the study of, you know, the bio biology or the body, you know. Um, but so, so there you can't do the replication crisis in sociology and psychology. I and mean, this is a lot of going to be a lot of psychology in this um, presentation. It is shit. Psychology is shit. And I studied it. So I know. Anyway, uh, toys today look very similar to the toys of 1952. In the 1970s, few toys targeted a specific gender and 70% of toys had no specific gender labels at all. In fact, advertisement during this time were more likely to show girls driving cars and airplanes and boys playing in the kitchen. While some leading companies such as Target and Walmart have agreed to tone down their gender specific children's marketing strategies, experts... How are you an expert on this? Wonder if it's enough. How do you become an expert? So what's the big deal? Strongly gender typed toys that young children are exposed to and learn to prefer appear to be less supportive of optimal development. Okay. These toys that were most educational and developed children's physical, cognitive, and artistic skills were typically gender neutral. When children are quote unquote taught to prefer one color over another, they are developing a specific skill set. Play with masculine toys is associated with large motor development and spatial skills, while play with feminine toys is associated with developing fine motor skills, fingers, language, and social skills. In other words, male and female, they're optimizing your male and female nature. Boys are more into uh, math and you know different things like that, and girls are into different things. Uh, Anybody with children knows this, but you know, these are people who, you know, they never leave a classroom. So let's, uh, let's continue reading this piece. We should be encouraging well-rounded kids. Always be scared when somebody tells you that they want you to be well-rounded, right? That's how you get, uh, that's how you get mandated to take classes you don't need to take in college because they want you to be a well-rounded student. So now you have to, you want to be a biology major, but you have to take stupid English classes and, uh, art classes and all that type of stuff. It just balloons the cost of your college experience. And because you'll probably graduate very fast if you would just go to college for what you went to college for. You know, college is one of the only things where you can go in there for one thing and end up getting jammed into a bunch of other stuff, right? That's why so many people go to college and they're in college for so long because they they're forced to take so many classes that they don't even know what they went to college for in the first place. But let's, let's continue. We should be encouraging encouraging well-rounded kids with diverse interests and skills. If we fast forward into the future, these preferences extend into future roles and occupations. Ironically, 70% of mothers in the labor force and domestic responsibilities have, are shared more equitably than ever before. In conclusion, strong gender type toys might foster attributes that aren't ones you want to encourage. Strong gender type toys might foster attributes that aren't ones you want to encourage. What does that mean? What does that mean? What attributes? What attributes? Okay, for girls, this would be a focus on attractiveness and appearance with the most important message to look pretty. For boys, this emphasis is on violence and aggression, which might be less desirable in the long run. Michigan State University Extension, 
which is where I'm reading this from, believes it is important to educate yourself and extended family members on how gender neutral toys are important in promoting healthy development in children now and in the future. Uh, this, this is absolute nonsense, but this is where you get the, the laws, right? You see, this is the, the foundation of these types of laws that are going to force people into behaving a certain way and thinking a certain way. So let's go now over to Steven, to Steven Pinker. Let's see what he has to say about this. And this is called the blank slate. Um, so I'm going to read an article from, I believe it was written by Steven Pinker of Howard university. And I don't see a year. I believe it was in 20, 2003. Oh, it was 2006. Okay. Written in 2006. It says, uh, the first, the first doctrine is the one that gave the book its title, the blank slate conventionally associated with the English philosopher, John Locke. He didn't actually use the metaphor of the blank slate in his writings, but he did invoke a similar metaphor. He wrote, let's suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper void of all characters without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished to this? I answer in one word from experience. That is the doctrine of the blank slate. Blank slate was not just an empirical hypothesis, but it had a moral and political import in Locke's time, as it does today. It implied that dogmas such as the divine right of kings could not be treated as self-evident truths that just grew out of the structure of the brain, but had to be justified by experiences that people share and hence can debate. It undermined the heredity, hereditary loyalty, or royalty, I'm sorry, and aristocracy, who could claim no innate wisdom or virtue in their minds started out as a blank as everyone else's. And by that same token, it undermined the institution of slavery by holding that slaves could not be considered innately inferior or subservient. These ideas are summed up in a New Yorker cartoon of about 11 years ago, in which one king says to another, I don't know anything about the bell curve, but I say hereditary, heredity is everything. The blank slate is not ancient history, but continues in the influent to be influ influential. I'm sorry. The blank slate is not ancient history, but continues to be influential through most of the 20th century. My own field psychology tried to explain all of human behavior by appealing to a couple of simple mechanisms of association and conditioning. The social sciences have tried to explain the human condition by invoking culture as an autonomous force that can't be identified with anything inside the heads of any particular individuals. I'm going to read that again because I want people to recognize that I, I literally just said this. The social sciences have tried to explain the human condition by invoking culture like toys, like retail stores, as an autonomous force that can't be identified with anything inside the heads of any particular individuals. In other words, when you make these laws, they're saying that the genders, quote unquote, are created by the gendering, which is a circular reasoning and not by anything people actually believe or anything people actually aspire to be or anything people actually like or anything innate in you, that everything comes from your experience. You can only experience things. You don't actually have any natural emotions. That's what makes you blank, right? So here's an example from a prominent 20th century social scientist. With the exception of in instinctoid reactions of infants to sudden withdrawals of support to sudden loud noises, the human being is entirely instinctless. Man is man because he has no instincts, because everything he is and has become, he has learned, acquired from his culture, from the man-made part of the environment, from other human beings. This is a quote from anthropologist and well-known public intellectual Ashley Mokta Montagu, Montagu, okay, Montagu. And just to show how far this doctrine has spread, I'll give you another example from a well-known public figure invoking a similar metaphor. When kids go to school at age six, there's an empty bucket there. Someone by the time they're 18 will fill that bucket. Is it going to be a parent? Is it going to be a good educator? Or is it going to be some other scum out there? So that is a quote from California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. So this is this is it. You are you are uh, an empty bucket to be filled with whatever other people decide to fill you with. And um, this is, uh, of course, ridiculous, but it's also quite dangerous. Um, so, 
But let's let's keep going. It says it should come as no surprise that I think that there's a huge problem with all of this, beginning with the blank slate. The main problem is that the blank slates don't do anything. It's not that any sane person can deny the central importance of learning, culture, and socialization in all aspects of human experience. The question is, how do they work? When Locke implied that there is nothing in, in the intellect that was not first in the senses, the appropriate reply came from Leibniz, who, was, who responded, except for the intellect itself. Today, the sciences of human nature have threatened the blank slate by trying to delineate what has to be present in the mind in order for learning to occur in the first place. My own field, cognitive, cognitive science, has tried to explicate the innate mechanisms that have obviously gets that have to be in place in order to get learning that obviously gets done. They include the basic concept of an of an enduring object and lawful causation, which can be seen even in young infants. A number sense that allows us to grab quanti qu grasp quantity of numbers, a number of spatial representations that allow us to negotiate the world and recognize objects and faces, a quote theory of mind or intuitive psychology, which we understand the mental states of other people, a science instinct that allows us to communicate our own thoughts and feelings via words and the ex executive systems of the frontal lobes of the brain, which receive information from the rest of the brain and execute decisions, rules that determine how the person as a whole behaves. We're going to continue. I don't know how much of this I'm going to read, but I'm going to, I'm going to read it till we get the point, <laughs> which I think we already got. But there's a lot of different ways that he says that the blank slate is being challenged. He says evolutionary psychology has challenged the blank slate in at least two ways. One is that doc by documenting that beneath the undeniable fact of cross-cultural variation, there is a bedrock of human universals, ways of thinking and feeling and behaving that can be seen in all of the cultures documented by ethnogra ethnography. Okay, so that's uh, evolutionary psychology has challenged the blank slate in another way by showing that many human drives can't really be understood as ways people maximize their well-being in their own lifetimes but can only be interpreted as adaptations to survival and reproduction in an ancestral environment, namely the foraging lifestyle that characterized our species through 99% of its evolutionary history until the very recent invention of agriculture and industrialization. Right. So for, as an obvious example, very much in the news is our taste for sugar and fat, which drives many people to an early grade from diet, from, from too much uh, junk, junk food. Okay. The obvious explanation is that we evolved in a world in which these nutrient-packed substances were in short supply, and we can never consume too many of them. Very recently, we developed the technology to crank out mass quantities of this stuff. Our tastes haven't changed, and so we eat more of them than it is good for us. In other words, um, through newer science, we've learned that human beings can become addicted to sugar and fat, all right? Um, but we never had access to so much sugar and fat before in our lives. So it seems like we are just adapting to our new environment. So let's, uh, let's continue. Neuroscience has challenged the blank slate by showing that there's a complex genetic pattern to the brain. An example being that being the well-known wiring diagram of the primate visual system comprising some 50 distinct areas interconnected in precise ways largely laid out in the course of prenatal development. So there's prenatal interesting things going on here. So this says, and it's not just the overall box and arrow diagram of the brain that shows a genetic influence, but some of its fine structure as well. The neuroscientist Paul Thompson studied a sample of people using MRI and measured the amount of gray matter across the surface of the brain. He did conclude calculated correlation coefficients among pairs of people to see if the distribution of gray matter will be correlated across pairs of people. Of course, when you pair people at random, by definition, the correlations are going to be zero. But when you compare people who are who share half their DNA, namely fraternal twins, most of the brain shows some degree of significant correlation. And when you pair people who, who share all of their DNA, namely monozygotic or identical twins, more areas Far more areas of the brain show correlations, and you, and to much a greater degree. 
So it says, now you might ask whether these are just meaningless differences in anatomy, like the precise shape of the worlds in your outer ear. But there is evidence that they have a functional consequence. My favorite summary comes from another New Yorker cartoon, this time from Charles Adams, which shows two nerdy looking guys with identical contraptions in their lap in the waiting room of a Malifert, no wait, in, in the waiting room of a paternity, patent, uh, patent uh, eternity. God damn. And the caption reads, separated at birth, the Malifert twins meet accidentally. The cartoon is only a slight exaggeration of the empirical state of affairs. Studies of identical twins who have separated at birth and been tracked down and tested in adulthood show that they have often astonishing, astonishing similarities. My favorite example is the pair of twins, one of whom was brought up in a Catholic Brought up as a Catholic in a Nazi family in Germany, the other of whom was brought by a Jewish father in Trinidad. Nevertheless, when they meet each other in the lab in the 1940s, both walked in wearing identical navy blue shirts with epaulets. Both of them kept rubber bands around their wrists. Both of them, it turned out on questioning, liked to be dipped, liked to dip buttered toast in coffee, to flush the toilet before using it as a well as after, and to pretend to sneeze in crowded elevators to watch other people jump. So in other words, there are things in, encoded in your DNA, behaviors, attitudes, etc., that you, you can only see that, you know, most people don't know anything about, you know. So there are behaviors already encoded into your brain that, of course, as a baby, as a toddler, you can't act out. For instance, in boys, it is aggression. Um, so like baby boys tend to be a, a lot more active. They're a lot more aggressive than girls. They're a lot, you know, so boys typically get into more trouble because they're more active. Girls are typically more passive. Um, this of course is not 100% because nothing is 100%, but is, uh, a, a total overall, like if you have a typical daughter, a typical son, you understand that boys and girls like different things. They approach the world differently. They like different toys. They like different activities. They like different books, TV shows, movies, etc. So there is, of course, a desire to get rid of all of that. So now we're going to move over to Mises.org. Um, and this article by, written by Richard M. Ebeling in 2017 is called Tyrants of the Mind and the New Collectivism. So he says the current counter-revolution against liberty is being fought on a number of fronts in American society. One is on the college and university campuses across the country where the ideology of, quote, political correctness is strangling the principle and practice of freedom of speech and the ideal of intellectual controversy and debate. Critical to, to this campaign against free expression and open exchange of competing and opposing ideas is the capture of the language through which this campaign has been instigated and the linguistic characteristics of its protagonists. We need to remember and reflect upon the fact that it is our, through our language that we think about ourselves, our relationships to others, and the general social order in which we live, that we share with those others. Words do not simply define or delineate the names of objects, individuals, events, or actions. Words also contain and connote meanings, that create mental imageries, emotions, attitudes, and beliefs in people that influences and colors how they see themselves and the world around them. In other words, words matter. Words have specific meanings. And when people start to play with words, then you get people losing uh, connections between themselves and and other things. In other words, when you see people and say stuff like, uh, you need to be less white. And then they say, well, white isn't a race. It is a collection of characteristics and stereotypes, etc." But then they also say <clears throat> that white is a people, right? They're just playing word games with you. So here it is. Um, he's going to go through some history. He says the Nazi manipulation of mind through language. Uh, it says, we may turn to Victor Klemperer, a German Jew who survived in the Nazi Germany outside of the concentration camp system because his wife was not Jewish. And she stood by and defended him throughout the Second World War. Several years after the defeat of Hitler and National Socialist Regime in 1945, Klemperer wrote a book 
called The Language of the Third Reich. A professor of Romance languages at a university in Dresden before Hitler's rise to power in 1933, he was especially attuned to the uses and nuances of their words and their contextual meanings. He kept a detailed and truly fascinating diary about the daily life during the Nazi era in Germany, the full contents of which was published under the title I Will Bear Witness, A Diary of the Nazi Years. Long after he passed away, he drew upon these meticulous observations in writing the language of the Third Reich in the 1950s. Klemperer argued that virtually everyone in Hitler's Germany was a Nazi, whether or not they considered themselves to be national socialists, including many of the victims of the regime, including German Jews. Think about that. They had such control over the language that even the Jews were Nazis. Why? because they had been captured by and had adapted in their thoughts and beliefs the ideas and ideology of their Nazi masters. They found it difficult to think about life and morality in any other way, that is, to reason in a way independent of the language of words and political phrases reflecting the Nazi conceptions of man, quote-unquote race, and society. In their minds, Klemperer were suggesting they were no longer self-governing human beings, but slaves of the regime, since they thought and acted in terms of the lexicon and logic of Hitler's National Socialism. In other words, to say again, Hitler had such control over the country, he controlled the language. And controlling the language, you ended up controlling people's thoughts, and then you controlled their behaviors. So that's why people need to pay attention. When you start talking about gender neutrality and forcing upon people gender neutrality, this also ends up taking place in communist China. There's a lot of quote unquote gender neutrality in communist China. So let's continue here because I think this is very interesting. And I want y'all really to, 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 to kind of get, get, get a little bit more of this. Klemperer said that it was not the Nazis. He said, Klemperer said that it was not that the Nazis made up very many new words, though they did in some cases with intentional design. But what's far more invidious, he argued, is that through their own particular uses of existing words over and over again in their propaganda, speeches, and publications, they changed the meanings and context of, the, of these taken-for-granted words in the German language. The Nazis, through this method, made words have only one meaning, the collective or shared meaning servicing, serving the Nazis' purposes. Quote, Making language the servant of its dreadful system, it procures it in its most powerful, most public, and most serendipitous means of advertising. Klemperer explained, The sole purpose of the Nazi use and form of language is to strip everyone of their individuality, to paralyze them as personalities, to make them into unthinking and docile cattle in a herd driven and hounded in a particular direction to turn them into atoms in a huge rolling block of stone. Where Nazi language addresses the individual, where it educates, it means of breeding fanaticism and techniques of mass suggestion. So they propagandize people, and he goes into this again with the Soviets. No difference. No different in the ideological technique of bending language to their purposes was the communist regime of Soviet Russia. Russian historian Mikhail Heller highlighted this aspect of the socialist planning society in his insightful work, Cogs in the Wheel, The Formation of Soviet Man. From the time of Vladimir Lenin, with the coming of the Bolshevik Revolution in, the 19, in 17, 1917, uh, through the near 25-year reign of Joseph Stalin, to the Soviet leaders at the end of the regime in 1991, Language was made to serve the means and ends of the socialist system. Heller explained, Lenin developed a special way of writing that made it possible to establish the, quote, formula slogan in the mind of the reader or listener. Then, as the most important compositional element, there is the use of repetition by means of which a rectangle is formed, which concentrates the attention, narrows the field of possibilities, and squeezes through a tight ring from which there is only one exit. Total power of the word gives the master of the word a magical power over all communications. Soviet speech is always a monologue because there is no other way to talk. 
allow me to be a little bit more specific. Soviet speech is always a monologue because there is no other party to talk to. In other words, everybody is in the party. On the other side is the enemy. In the Soviet language, there are no neutral words. Every word carries an ideological burden. That is why in Soviet language, the same words are repeated over and over again until they become a signal that acts without any effort or thought. The effect of set of phrases and slogans is also assured by their always being repeated in absolutely the same form. The Soviet language became the most important means of preventing people from acquiring more knowledge that the state wished. Soviet speech lost its freedom. The language was put together out of slogans and quotations from the leader, Stalin. The crushing, unquestioned authority of the leader's word is the result to a large extent of his right and power to name the enemy. The word that signifies the enemy must be striking, easy to remember, implying condemnation by its very sound and always imprecise so that everyone who at a given moment does not please the leader can be concluded under its rubric. Like the word racist, like the word homophobe, like the word transphobe, like the word sexist. Do you get it? Like the words gender neutral. Gender neutral is supposed to sound good because if you're not gender neutral, you're being sexist. So this is where this stuff comes from. There is there is so much of this stuff out there today, you know, and I could read I could read on and on and on with this stuff. Right. But there's no need. You have the state of California trying to pass laws mandating how people should think and look at retail stores. Not only is it a violation of the retail stores, freedom of speech. Because labeling is speech. Now, um, not only can you not label things which you want to label them, you also are exerting a, a lot of coercion over that over that office, over these retail stores, which are private businesses. You know, these private businesses are being told by the government what they have to do. That's fascism. So I want to leave you guys with this. This is another passage from the Ebeling article. Academia, the new race collectivism and word tyranny. A distinct difference between the proponents of this new race collectivism compared to the 20th century episodes of German Nazism or Soviet socialism is that this linguistic totalitarianism and word indoctrination is being advanced and imposed without any direct coercive and monopoly apparatus of governmental power. Instead, the quote unquote headquarters and quote unquote front lines are in academia especially in some of those institutions of higher learning that are oases of intellectual autonomy from accountability or challenge due primarily or heavily taxpayer funded salaries like Michigan state university, where I read that paper talking about how the dangers of gender, of gender toys, right? Gender, uh, Michigan state university is heavily taxpayer funded. So nobody really questions what they do. Right? So, Programs and curriculums, free, freed from the world of market-based work and reward and blessed with lifetime tenure, those academics employed on these islands of educational socialism have the quote-unquote safe spaces within which there can be cultivated to use, to use George Orwell's phrase, quote, some ideas so absurd that only an, elect, an elect, elect, intellectual can believe them. Uh, let me read that again. Some ideas so absurd that only an intellectual can believe them. The assertion of and repetition of, quote, right privilege, quote, the one percent, quote, social justice, quote, racist, quote, gay basher, quote, LGBT hater, quote, gender insensitivity, etc., have had numbing effects on public and private discourse. It has produced degrees of self-censorship out of fear that the wrong word, the misplaced phrase, the wrong, uh, wrongly understood witticism or an intentionally offended double entendre will bring down an avalanche of criticisms and threats to one's job, social status or acceptance among professional and informal circles in society. You know, kind of like one one thousand dollar fines if you don't uh, unisex your retail areas. <laughs> 
Similar to the robot-like expressionless faces seen in the videos of, or crowds of people in some scenes from North Korea, the politically correct world of American progressivism and the new race collectivism threatens to drain human interaction of spontaneity, banter, and the real and relevant diversity of views, voices, and modes of expression and argumentation. Increasingly, people feel that they have to be, quote, walking on eggs, never knowing who might take anything said or done as an offense against some ethnic or racial group or person, and the offender finding himself in the dock of social condemnation and ostracism. Another technique of the new race collectivism and progressivism is to take what is normally accepted as reasonable and appropriate modes of polite and courteous behavior and turn it into a weapon to serve its own agendas. Huh. We all know and usually attempt not to intentionally say or do something that will offend or be embarrassing to someone we are associating with in some social setting. We just know it's not, quote, the right thing to do. And if we see someone going out of the way to, in fact, act in this inappropriate manner, we find it inappropriate and, quote, not right, even if we remain silent and don't do anything in response to it. The new race collectivists and progressives have learned to use this notion of proper etiquette and good manners that acts as a break on most of us in, social, in the social arena as a weapon to silence and beat down anyone or anything not consistent with their worldview and political agenda. Anything said or done inconsistent with their ideas and ideology is hurtful, quote unquote hurtful to some oppressed minority or subgroup in society. It shows an insensitivity and misunderstanding of that group's experiences, history, culture, or degrees of suffering caused by quote unquote white privilege or quote unquote the capitalist system or made to feel guilty in some thought, saying some word or expressing some idea and fearful about the consequences of doing so. An increasingly successful Orwellian like thought police of politically correct quote unquote news speak is imposed on people in almost every circumstance of social life. So there it is. Uh, you have these laws that are being passed that are, and they admit that they're pushing an agenda. They say that it's harmful for children, but can't tell you how it's harmful. Then they say, well, it should be harmful for little girls to want to be pretty. How is that harmful? It should be harmful for little boys to want to be aggressive. Hey, you're supposed to control their aggression, not tamp it down. That, that's really what parenting is all about. But in these situations, like in the state of California, they believe that the state owns your children. Okay? That is, and that's why in California they do things like try to ban homeschooling. Everybody's kids has to go to a state-sponsored school because, like we just talked about in this Ibling article, this is where they produce the bullshit. This is where they, they want you. They want to slide your child through the manufacturing arm of their socialist agenda. And it just begins with retail stores being forced to make be unisex, quote unquote. There's no reason for this. Right. There's no there's no societal benefit to it. Not any measurable societal benefit. The point of it is to exert power, to exert control to define words, to define thought, to define actions. That is the point. The point isn't to keep people out of jail, to get people out of jail. None of this has to do with jail. It's all about authority, forcing people to do and think what you want. That is the point here. All right, so this has been Policy Matters from Mongo Slate. Thank you guys for listening. Feel free to uh, like, share, and subscribe. Feel free to spread the good word of this channel. And feel free to send money if you want to uh, via the Cash App. It will be uh, in, the, in the comment section below. Um, thank you guys for your time. Hopefully you, you, you learned something and you enjoyed yourself. And um, I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace. Yeah. Da, 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 da.